أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله. الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهديه الله فلا مضل له وما يضلل فلا تجد له وليا مرشدا. وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم وما يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار. We praise Allah subhanahu wa taala. We ask Him to send His peace and blessings upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and all of the prophets from Adam to Muhammad and upon the Al of Sayyid al Awwalin upon the community. Of the Prophet Sallallahu upon his family and his companions and those who follow the path of righteousness until the end of time. As Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala warns us, Allah warns us not to follow the path of other than the believers. فَنَسْأَلُهُ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى إِنْ يَجْعَلْنَا مِنْ أَهْلِهِ We ask Allah to make us from Ahli Allah, from the people of Allah and the Ahl of Sayyidina Rasulullah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Every day we have a special relationship with something. Every day. It's not our spouse, that's important. It's not our children, that's important. It's not our Blackberry or our smartphone or our email account. Those things we have special relationships with. But every day we have a special relationship with, with something that shapes how we see the world as Muslims and how we see our, our purpose. Allah wa hiya Surah Fatiha. Surah Fatiha. At a minimum, we read it 17 times a day. At a minimum, if we're establishing the obligatory prayers. We have a special relationship with this surah. You know, there's a study that was done how much time do people spend in front of the television in, in an average lifespan? How much time do they spend in their car in an average lifespan? Even how much time do they spend in the restroom? There should be a study done, done how much time we spend with Al-Fatiha. That will make it clear to us like how important this surah is, this chapter is. And that's why Al-Hasan, Al-Basri, as related by Sheikh al-Islam uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, he said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent 365 books فَجَمَّعَهَا and he collected those four books, those 365 books into four books. Torah, Zabur, Injil, and Quran. The Torah, the Injil, the Psalms, the New Testament, and the Quran. 
And then he collected those four and summarized them into one as the Quran. And then he summarized the entire Quran into Al Mufassal. From short, the 49th chapter to the end of the Quran is called Al Mufassal. Most Muslims, they should memorize the Mufassal at least. Then he took that and summarized that in Al Fatiha. So Al Fatiha, subhanAllah, is the site map of 365 books sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And all of that was summarized in the statement, Surah Fatiha. We, we should look at the Quran as something that we have a relationship with. That's why some of the ulama, they said, some scholars, they said, in Surah Duha, when the Prophet ﷺ was sad, actually he was sad because he missed wahi. He missed revelation. He missed the Quran. He longed for the Quran. Um Ayman radiallahu anha, she was a great companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he used to visit her weekly sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa had passed away, Sayyidina Abi Bakr and Umar, they continued to visit her and they found her one time crying as related by Al-Bukhari and they said to her, don't you know that what the Messenger of Allah has with Allah is better than what he had in this life? And she said, that's not what I miss. I miss Al-Wahi. Like, I miss the Qur'an. I miss the Qur'an being sent to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. I remember once, there was a sister who was studying where I memorized the Qur'an. An American sister. And I came around the corner and she was crying. So I was worried. I said to her, are you okay? Did something happen to you? She said, no, I missed my lesson with my sheikh today. And I was so excited to read the book of Allah to him. Longing for the Quran. So Surah Al-Fatiha has some fundamental principles by which we live by. And the first is helping us see the larger picture. As a community, we lost focus. We've become a community that's focused on very little things. And the Quran actually encourages us to see the larger picture. That's how the Muslims were able to spread Islam in its early days and have an impact on society because they were so wide in their vision. Allah said, وَفِي الْأَثَاقِ You know, Allah talked to the Arabs about seeing things in the horizon. He talked to the illiterate Arabs. What's the first word he sent? Iqra, read, recite. That was far from there. There were only 11 people in Mecca who could read when that verse came down. Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. So it was challenging them. A few surahs later, Noon wal qalimi wa ma yasturun. A few chapters later, Allah is talking about a pin. A pin in the days of the Prophet is like a bitly in these days of ours. It was rare for someone even to have a pin. So the Quran expands the vision of these simple people to see beyond their own plight and to have a larger vision of what's around them. It challenges them to become literate and it challenges them to be productive. Literacy, iqra. Productive, al-kitaba. And that's why some of the scholars, they said the Quran is called al-kitab because the master of kitab is al-kitaba. Some scholars, they said that the Quran's name is kitab because the word kitab means to write. So not only do you learn for yourself, but your vision is so broad, your focus is so wide, you are beneficial to other people. And that's why we talked about a few weeks ago that the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the believer is like a date tree because the date tree, its benefit is limitless. We ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and يُعْلِمْنَا مِنْ فَعْنَا وَنْفَعْ بِمَا عَلِمْتَنَا يَا رَبَّنَا And that's why our scholars, whenever we sit with them, they made this dua for us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make your knowledge beneficial to you and may he make you of benefit to those you teach. Qira'ah wa al-kitabah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the beginning of Surah Al-Fatiha opens our minds to think universally, to go beyond tribalism, qabaliya, to go beyond our tongues, because our languages are an ayam and ayati rabbina subhanahu wa ta'ala are a sign from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to move beyond these juziyat dunyawiyya these little you know worldly perspectives and to think broader so what's the first verse we read alhamdulillahi al-arab 
رب العرب الحمد لله رب الصماليين الحمد لله رب أمريكان الحمد لله رب العالمين الله سبحانه وتعالى said this verse in a context of a society that was rocked by tribalism and racism rocked by a, a, a very very acute dichotomy based on wealth and social status Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't say praise be to Allah the Lord of the Arabs praise be to Allah the Lord of the Somalis praise be to Allah the Lord of the white Americans he said praise be to Allah the Lord of everything Muslim. at that moment the mind of the Muslim is forced it's challenged to think beyond these simple things universality and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in describing our beloved Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam وَيُفَرِّقْ بَيْنَ الْعَوْلَمَ وَلَالْعَالَمِيَّ There is a difference between globalization and universality. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to these people in Surah A'raf in Mecca when the number of Sahaba are under 70, it's only 70 Muslims. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ Subhanallah. He didn't speak just to the Arabs in Mecca, the Quraysh, Bani Hashim, Bani Abdul Muttalib. He speaks to humanity through this person. Challenging how they look at the world. Ya ayyuha nas, inni rasulullahi ilaykum jami'a. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Oh mankind, I'm the messenger of Allah, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sent to every single person. Our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who said there's no difference between an Arab between an Arab and a non-Arab illa bi taqwa except in piety. So the Muslims are immediately pushed to think in a broader context and to see the larger picture. And that's why one of the Sahabi Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu anhu he said we used to sit in Mecca and think about Islam and that it will touch the entire world. We were not restricted to Dar Arqam. We were not restricted to the Masjid. We're not restricted to our people. We used to imagine how will Islam reach the entire known world to us. They were a visionary people. Radiallahu ta'ala anhum. And their vision was shaped by the universality of Al Quran Al Kareem. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, He warns us. And a number of occasions not to get caught up in the little issues. And he encourages us to see the broader picture. For example, whenever you know you do Tafsir Sult Kahf, 18th chapter of the Quran, we read it every Friday. Undoubtedly, somebody will ask you, what kind of dog was it? You know, what type of dog was it? I've actually seen people get in a fight in the masjid over, not this masjid, over what type of dog was it? Was it a beagle? You know, was it a Shetland sheep dog? Was it a Rottweiler? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he didn't mention that. Or you'll find in Surah Al-Baqarah, what type of tree was it? You know, what was it an apple tree? Was it an orange tree? Was it a date tree? Al-Shatibi, Al-Mariki, in Al-Muwaffaqat, he said in the ninth, the, the fourth volume, when I was reading it with Sheikh Amr Wardani, Hafizullah. He has an important point where he says that the Sharia, Islam, only encourages us to engage in things that lead to action, that lead to practice, not to be khayaliyin, not to just be constantly, you know, dreaming and thinking, but to be active oriented. And he said, for example, in the Quran, there will be times where you'll notice Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He atnaba bil asha, you know, He embellishes things. The end of Surah Tahrim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions at the end of this chapter called Tahrim, three women. The wife of Lut, four women. The, the wife of Nuh. Then He mentions the wife of Fir'aun and Maryam. If you notice about Lut and Nuh, فَلَمْ يُغْنِيَ عَنْهُمَا مِنَ اللَّهِ شَيْئَ As all the Qur'an says about them, it doesn't talk about their names, it doesn't talk about who they were, where they are from, it doesn't pay a lot of attention to them. 
But when it gets to Fir'aun's wife, Rabbi bin li indaka baytan fil jannah, talks about the supplication she made. What's important is to understand how she dealt with oppression. But then when it comes to Maryam, wa Maryaba, the bint of Imran, allati ahsan laha farjaha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes into detail. He talks about Maryam, you know, in an incredible way. Why? That's something that you need to pay attention to. It's something that I need to think about, at least to practice, at least to action. People will come to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They'll ask him questions sometimes that have nothing to do with practice. And he responds in a way that leads to practice. His community wasn't a community of gossip columnists. The Muslim community in many ways has become a community of gossip columnists. We complain. But when you hear people complain, ask them, do you volunteer? Do you help? Are you involved? Or just sit around like Ann Landers and answer people's complaints? Ask the people. What are you doing? So the Prophet ﷺ, when the man comes to him and says, Mata sa'a ya Rasulullah. Wallahi subhanAllah, if someone asks this question now, they're going to get in trouble. They said, when is the hour? Somebody came to Muhammad ﷺ and asked him this question in Sahih al-Bukhari. When is the day of judgment? Now if someone came into the masjid, when is the day of judgment? We're going to pull out a book of Aqidah, Akhi, this question, now you have to take shahada again. Akhi, your Aqidah is batila, fasida. He, he comes to Muhammad alayhi salatu wassalam and says to him, Mata sa'a ya Rasulallah. When is the hour? Prophet Sassam said to him, Ma adda laha. A shatibi says something incredible here. The Prophet said to him, What did you prepare for it? A shatibi said, This question is so far away, so far removed from practicality. But you see, the greatness of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam, who takes this question which is impractical and gives it a practical answer. And that is, what did you prepare for it? How are you living for it? I'mal, act on it. In the Quran, they would ask the, the Prophet sometimes the Sahaba questions that are not focused. Yes, They ask you about the moons. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers in a way that leads to you feed al-amal. It brings about a sense of practice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds, it's a way for people to tell time and a way for people to understand when is the hajj. So here we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he brings the fa'ida dunyawiyya wa fa'ida ukhrawiyya in one answer, subhanallah. And that's why those responses in the Quran for yas'alunak, yas'alunak, we study them in ifta. Because the best mufti is the one who when he answers or she answers, brings a benefit in this life and brings a benefit in the hereafter. Subhanallah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when they ask him, when is, what's the secret, O Muhammad, behind the moons and this and that, the esoteric reality? Allah said, they are a means to organize your life and they are a means to establish hajj. He brings both together. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our beloved messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he encouraged us not to get caught up in little things, to keep us from the larger picture. When he said, Kuriha lakum qil wa qal, he said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, it's forbidden for you to constantly talk about things and to constantly, you know, mention things in a way that creates trouble, that breeds trouble. And he said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, inna a'zam al-Muslim, he said the most dangerous Muslim for the Muslims is the one who asks about something lam yuharram, that wasn't forbidden but because he or she asked about it it became haram on the community sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam very beautifully in the hadith of Abi Huraira radiyallahu anhu he said وَمَا أَمَرْتُكُمْ بِهِ فَأْتُوا مِنْهُمْ استطعتم. what I ordered you to do do it as best you can وَمَا نَهَيْتُكُمْ عَنْهُ فَاجْتَنِبُوا and what I told you to avoid it Avoid it. Because the thing that destroyed you and the thing that destroyed those communities before you was what? Asking a lot of questions of no benefit. Doesn't mean that we shouldn't ask. Because the beloved messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as he said to Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu, kama rawahu al-Bukhari, the Prophet sallallahu said, the solution to any problem is to ask a question. This is not what he means by asking questions. What he means by asking questions about things that forget the broader image, the broader picture, the broader focus, and don't lead to action, but create trouble 
for others. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us a vision. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us in order to live prophetic lives in the light of our beloved messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. First and foremost, the Quran illustrates how we should function, how we should think, how, how we can have that focus. And that is that we marry two things together. Tasfiyat al-qalb, having a pure heart with itqan al-amal, with having good actions. And that's why in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he mentions people who earned his wrath, al-fatiha, or people who went astray, he usually mentions that they have one of two qualities. And another, and, and another quality that they're missing. The quality that one might have is knowledge without the heart. Allah mentions about those nations before us that they held on to the Torah during the time of Moses, but they did not act on it. So the heart wasn't there. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَرَهْبَانِيَ إِبْتَدَعُهَا مَا كَتَبَنَاهَا عَلَيْهِمْ Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about those followers of Sayyidina Isa after he rose to the heavens, how they in invented رَهْبَانِيَ how they invented this monk hermit lifestyle. So one has knowledge without تَسْكِيَةِ النَّفْسِ The other has تَسْكِيَةِ النَّفْسِ without إِتْقَانَ الْعَمَلِ without, without the knowledge, الْعِلْمِ so both are deficient. But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the people of God, He says, what about them? إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهِ وَجِلَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَإِذَا تُلِيَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُ زَادَتْهُمْ إِيمَانًا وَعَلَى رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ الَّذِينَ يُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةَ وَمِمَّا رَزَقَنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ جَمَّعَ بَيْنَ تَسْفِيَةِ الْقَلْبِ وَإِتْقَانَ العمل. In this one verse, in Surah, the eighth chapter of the Quran, Allah says, those who believe are those who when Allah is mentioned, their hearts are moved. The heart is pure. And when the verses of Quran are recited to them, it increases them in faith, the heart. The next verse says, those who establish prayer and pay a charity. So they have the internal and the external, not one or the other. So how we should start if we're going to have this broader vision is with ourselves to make sure that my heart, insha'Allah ta'ala, is with Allah. And the way to battle the heart is with dhikr and Qur'an. Dhikr and Qur'an. The way to shut down the nafs is dhikr and Qur'an. The way to cast away shaitan is dhikr and Qur'an. That's it. And ibadah. The second aspect of that is that I should be a person of amal. I should be a person of practice. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and yuhi qulubana bil iman. Kama nas'aluhu subhanahu yuhabbib ilayna al-Qur'an. Aqulu qawli hadha astaghfirullah li wa lakum fastaghfiru innahu huwa al-ghafur rahim Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala sayyidina wa habibina rasulillah اللهم صل وسلم عليه في الأولين وفي الآخرين وفي الملء الأعلى يا رب العالمين. We praise Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. We ask Him to send His peace and blessings upon our beloved Messenger. إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما. اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا وحبيبنا رسول الله جلاء القلوب وأنوار العيون. Our beloved messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said something remarkable that helps us to see the broadness of our faith, the depth of Islam. And that is, he said, This hadith, you know, one of my teachers, he was from Iraq, a great scholar of Usul of Fiqh, Sheikh Taha. Uh, and he used to always see me and say this hadith. He was like, you know, here's this American guy coming all the way to study with me. I traveled to, to study with him, to read with him, usul. And he used to say to me this hadith when he would see me. And I remember once I was sitting with him next to the masjid and the khatib, he didn't come. So they asked him, and Sheikh, he's, he's on a wheelchair. 
So they ask him, do you have a khatib? He said, aha, amriki hada sayakhtub. You know, and I had to give khutbah in Arabic and I was so scared, I was shaking like this. Then when I finished, he said, ju'ilat al-ardu masjid al -tahur. Then he said, can you imagine someone who's not Arab gives a khutbah in our countries and some Arab is given a khutbah in America? He said, subhanallah, the prophet. And then he said this hadith, the whole world has been made a masjid for me. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This hadith actually is very profound if you think about what masjid means. Masjid makan sujood. Masjid means the place to pray, the place to make sujood. That's the zahir of the hadith. But what we understand the mafhum of the hadith is that this faith is meant for all places and all people and all communities and all ethnicities. And we as Muslims are commissioned we are commissioned to facilitate that process for people. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمْ يُسْرُ وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمْ عُسْرُ Allah wants ease for you. He doesn't want hardship for you. Our job is لَا نُسُدُّ نَاسْ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ To push people away from Allah, but to bring people to Allah. And to facilitate the process of understanding and knowing their Lord. And that's why Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, he said about the verse, Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrija li nas. You are the best community sent to people. He said, meaning that we make the way to God easy for others. The path of Allah is one, but the paths to the path are many. Sabirillah is only one way, but the subul, which people come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, are very different. So there's a few things we should think about. Number one, we should not be gossip columnists. A community that's based on gossip columnists, the worst newspapers in the country are those that are filled with gossip. You know, I remember my mother, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide her and all of the ummahat of our brothers and sisters. I remember when we would go to the grocery store, she used to treat those gossip magazines and newspapers like they were najis. And she used to tell me, don't put that in your mind. It's garbage. So a community that's, or communities that are based on just complaining and just talking and not helping, not volunteering, not serving, have gone against this universal principle of the Prophet And there's reasons for this. Number one is arrogance. Somebody, Somebody who learns Maybe from the for YouTube, maybe they learn from the internet, maybe they listen to a few cassettes in the old days, and they think now, you know what? I know more than all these people. There's no benefit in that knowledge. One of my teachers used to tell me, the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know. And I remember my first day in Al-Azhar, in the Kulliya, the first day ever I walked into my university, my faculty, Sharia. I met one Malaysian brother who I knew before, and he was very happy. So I asked him, Assalamu alaikum wa alaikum wa I said, you seem so happy. He said, today, alhamdulillah, I finished my, my um, you know, my, my munaqasha, my defense of my PhD. And alhamdulillah, I got MTS, you know, I did excellent. I was like, mashallah, you know, you're doctor now. And he said, yeah. I said, I have one question for you because this is my first day. So like I'm behind you by like 10 years. I said to him, what did you learn in 10 years? He said, I learned after 10 years in the Azhar how much I don't know. I learned that I need to learn more. In fact, he said, now I booked my ticket to go to Morocco to read with another sheikh in Morocco. You know, usually if you get your PhD, that's it, you're done, alhamdulillah. But he was like, la, atash, atash. The atash I have for knowledge doesn't stop. So imagine him compared to someone who reads one blog post or listens to one YouTube lecture and their heart becomes hard and they use that to judge the rest of the community. SubhanAllah, ask what's the fruit of the knowledge? The knowledge should soften the heart and create sakina and love for other people and service to people and a love for more knowledge. And that's why we see the companions of the Prophet Wasallam. Really incredible examples of not losing focus, even in difficult times. Once the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he stood up and he asked people, give, 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 give. And people didn't have much to give. 
There were some people that could give, but most of the people couldn't give. There were two Sahabi, subhan, look at their attitude. They had nothing. They had nothing. In fact, they, should, they were eligible for zakat. One of them, he went and he worked. And he saved his money over a long period of time. He worked and he saved his money and he came back to the Prophet ﷺ some time later. And he said to him, Ya Rasulullah, remember that time you asked people to give? I didn't have anything to give. But instead of feeling sorry for myself, I went and I worked. And here's what I'm going to give now. SubhanAllah, after like a month or two. The second was Umm Sulaim. Umm Sulaim, the mother of Anas ibn Malik. Radiallahu anha, who her husband became Muslim to, to, to marry her. L none of the Sahaba lost focus. Now a sister will bring her brother into the masjid. First thing, is he Muslim? Is he going to become Muslim so he can hook it up? You know, we'll actually like give him like a TSA thing. We'll put him through the scanner. But this man, he came into Medina and he said, Jit li atazawaj umma Sulaim. I want to marry this girl. And she said to him, you can't marry me. He said, well, you're not Muslim. He's like, khalas, uslim. He said, I'll become Muslim. None of the Sahaba lost focus. None of the Sahaba said, well, brother, you know, there's seven conditions of the Shahada. If you don't fulfill them, you can't be Muslim. They didn't say anything. In fact, watch what they said. Aslam, alhamdulillah. He became Muslim and then he married her. The Sahabi, they coined an idiom. They said, na'm al-mahr, mahr ummi sulaim. They used to say the best maher ever was the maher of Umm Sulaim. Her maher was her husband's Islam. Subhanallah. They didn't lose focus and he became a great sahabi. Alhamdulillah. He became a great companion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That positive attitude, not losing focus, contributing and being part of the greater process, understanding that if we all sit around in our gossip columnist, we're not going to go anywhere but to stay positive. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to appreciate how lucky we are to be given the lenses of Islam. The lenses of Islam let us see the infinite number of possibilities to alhamdulillah allow people to experience Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect those girls in Nigeria. Anyone who doubts the need for strong institution building just imagine what a few people can do in a few days, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, in the name of our faith. And it's beautiful. A lot of young Muslims started writing op-eds and sending, they were, somebody came to me, why don't you write this? Why don't you write that? Why don't you write this? I said, dude, I work 40 hours a week, bro. I got, I got bills to pay. It's the ninth. You know, I have children to call overseas and I cook my own meals. Can you cook? Because I'm hungry. So, well, well, uh, well then see, if you look at any, any major figure in this country, Barack Obama, he reads 80 newspapers a day, man. Somebody writes his speeches for him. So I said to the brother, write something, I'll look at it, and we can post it together. He said, I never thought about that before. I said, you should have thought before you complained. Help, kunu ansar Allah, be the helpers of Allah. Don't just be those who are constantly thinking negatively. Think positive. Help others. And our brother Yusuf, he last week, mashallah, he asked for volunteers. So many brothers and sisters came through in this community. We ran out of like being able to let volunteers do things. It's a good sign, alhamdulillah. So we see now people in the name of our religion, whether they are Muslim or not, is suspect as well. We don't even know who they are. But the point is they're using the name of our faith. To counter that, you have to have institutional impact. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and yahfadhana min ha'ula. We ask Allah to protect those young girls and to bring them back home to their family safely. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from ahlu bid'ah and ahlu dalala. And we ask Allah to protect us from the khawarij of this ummah. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and yuthabbit qulubana al-haq. Kama nas'aluhu subhanahu wa ta'ala and yuhyi qulubana bil-iman. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to revive our hearts with faith. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect those young girls. We ask Allah to protect everyone who's in harm's way or under any form of oppression. We ask Allah to forgive each and every one of us of our shortcomings. Oh Allah, you know 
the dirt that we brought into this masjid. Please let us leave clean. Take it from our hearts and take it from our lives. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect our children. We ask Allah to unite families together. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to let us die in a state where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with us. We ask Allah to unite us with our beloved Muhammad as we believe in him, walam narahu, and we did not see him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun, wa salamun ala al-muassaneen, walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.